be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to Conda Mason's Brown Rice Hour, a podcast that quilts together a fabric of connection between land, race, money, culture, and spirit. Discover a connection that engages with the most inspiring and cutting-edge thought leaders today, pointing toward our collective healing and liberation. If you are interested in supporting the Brown Rice Hour, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Conda. Welcome, 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 everyone. We are back with uh, the Brown Rice Hour, where we have conversations at the intersection of land, race, money, culture, and spirit. My name is Conda Mason, and I am your host for this hour. And today, we are blessed to have a beautiful, beautiful um, teacher and friend, um, my friend, Kyra Jewel Lingo, and welcome, Kyra Jewel. So happy to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Kanda. It is such a joy and honor to be with you. Oh, I love it. I love it. I'm so looking forward to our conversation. And, and Kyra is an extraordinary mindfulness meditation and Dharma teacher. She's an author, she's a mentor. And she has so much to offer. And I'm really looking forward to um, people hearing you and learning from you in in this hour. And we're going to talk a lot about your new book, which I think is amazing. So just a little bit of bio about Kyra. Kyra Jewel Lingo is she's a Dharma teacher who has a lifelong interest in blending spirituality and meditation and social justice. And at the age of 25, she entered the Buddhist monastery in Plum Village tradition. She spent 15 years living as a nun under the guidance of Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. She received lamp transmission from Thich Nhat Hanh and became a Zen teacher in 2007. And is also a teacher in the Vipassana Insight Lineage through Spirit Rock Meditation Center, where Kyra Jewell and I actually um, did our teacher training together. We are Dar- uh, Dharma siblings. And today she sees her work as a continuation of the engaged Buddhism developed by Thich Nhat Hanh, as well as the work of her parents, inspired by their stories and her dad's work with Martin Luther King Jr. on desegregating the South. We're going to get uh, into that. In addition to writing, we were made for these times, 10 Lessons in Moving Through Change, Loss, and Disruption, which is her new book. Um, she is also the editor of Thich Nhat Hanh's Planting Seeds, Practicing Mindfulness with Children. She especially feels called to share the Dharma with Black, Indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC people, as well as activists, educators, youth, artists, and families. So I am so thrilled um, to have you on the Brown Rice Hour, Kyra Jewel. And um, we're going to start by opening up a little bit of sacred space, which I like to do, beginning by honoring our ancestors and on the land and the land on which we are calling in from. And so I am actually in Louisiana, in New Orleans in this moment. I'm calling in from the land, the unceded land of the Choctaw people of Louisiana. And can you tell us where are you calling in from? Sure. I'm calling in from the unceded lands of the Muncie, Lenape, and Merrick peoples, uh, known now as Long Island. Um, Long, yes, Long Island, New York. Long Island, New York. So I, I love um, this time of the year um, when the veil between the living and the dead is so thin, right? Mm-hmm. In, in the fall is when we're yeah. taping this. And, and the ancestors are so present right now. Mm-hmm. I, I'm doing a lot of ancestor work and they're mm-hmm. just right here with us. And yeah. so I like to honor those who made it possible for us to be here. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. when I think about their journey and particularly as African-American, um, and uh, the journey of uh, 
how we're even here today is just amazing, I think, of all that has transpired to get us here. So I want to just honor those who mm-hmm. came before us. Um, I like to also honor those who are doing the work right now, including mm-hmm. this conversation, mm-hmm. including, you know, the work that you've been doing so mm-hmm. tirelessly, Kyra Jewel. I mm-hmm. adore you and how you have been so steady with teaching us how to integrate spirituality and our spirit along with social justice work. Mm. And so I want to honor you and the work that you're doing right now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kanda. I just want to say my mom's grandmother is from New Orleans as we think of ancestors. Um, Oh, is she? Yes. Margaret Tombs. Margaret Tombs from from New Orleans. I never met her. Yeah, I never met Beautiful. her, but um, yeah, so, so I feel... You have some lineage right where I'm feel a connection, sitting. that's right. <laughs> that's right. When I start my podcast, I uh, I like to talk about food. I work in food, I'm a foodie, it has changed. I think that there's a lot to be said about food and how it actually um, tells a story of people. Food tells a really interesting story and we find out a lot. So I begin by asking this question, and the question is... What, as a child, was your comfort food, and and who prepared it? Mm. So, I love the question. And, um, you know, I grew up in a pretty institutional setting. My parents were part of this Christian residential community based on a kind of monastic um, model for lay people with children. So I would eat with like a hundred other kids and it was, you know, frozen food. (laughs) It's like not very good food. One night a week, we got to eat with our parents, with our family. It was called family night. And I just have one of my favorite memories is of my mom cooking me and my brother omelets. And, and she had this way of mixing Coke and milk to make a poor man's root beer float. (laughs) (laughs) So that's my comfort food from childhood, that that family night with an omelet and Coke and milk. Coke and milk. (laughs) I have to say, out of all the answers that I've received from that question, this is a unique one. (laughs) Omelets and Coke and milk. Oh, my God. Family night. Well, we're going to get a lot into your background is so interesting. And so and you, you're pointing to that and we will be talking about that. And 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 actually in the book. So first, let me just say how much I love this book. We were made for these times. This is the book. And um, it is just um, it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful. It's so mm-hmm. the simplicity and the, the softness of it, and yet at the same time, the clear lessons. It's so you, Kyra Jewel. It just feels mm. like you. And yeah. um, and how in all the ends of the chapters, how we have, you know, you really bring it home with the meditations and the daily life practices and the journaling. It's mm. a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. And mm. I have to say that you quote some of my favorite people on the planet and, mm-hmm. and who have lived on this planet. It went mm. from James Baldwin and June Jordan, Toni Morrison, Bob Marley. It's like, mm. it's amazing um, how you weave in so much culture and so much um, dharma, so mm. much dharma and culture and, and wisdom. And so you also begin with your personal story and this incredible travel log. And so I would love um, from, you know, the Chicago, Nairobi, Mexico, Brazil, Plum Village. I mean, it's so fascinating, your life. Mm -hmm. And so much that I learned that I didn't know. And I would love for you to give us a little bit of background and tell us the history of how you grew up and your parents and something, you know, what you pointed to just now. So, yeah, let us find out what made who you are at this point in time in your life. Sure, sure. Um, you know, what What I'll just say is like, I, I feel like one thing I'm really grateful to both my parents, both of them are really um, dedicated spiritual seekers um, yes. and ha- have been, you know, for from a young age, both of them. Like my mom, when she was 12, this story never fails to amaze me. She, she grew up on the west side of Chicago. 
and uh, she 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 was in a church. I don't know if she was going with her family, but basically she was listening with that critical mind and like, I'm not sure mm-hmm. about this. And so she set out to find her own church at age 12. She went wow. looking for where she really felt the message was resonating with her. So (laughs) at 12, 12, right. So, um, and then my dad, you know, kind of broke, broke with what his family expected him to do and became a minister and then joined the civil rights movement. And it was downhill from there as far as his family is concerned. Um, anyway, so he's a white Southerner from Texas, my mom black from inner city, um, inner city Chicago. And so, so they met in the 60s, got married in 68 and joined. My dad was already part of this, um, what was called the Ecumenical Order or the Ecumenical Institute. It was really a group of people trying to live together and model how we could renew the church so that it really responded wow. to the suffering of the times, like really engaged Christianity. Yeah. So in the well, 80s. First of all, just like- just saying, let me just stop you one quick say it, thinking yeah. about the idea that in 1968, an interracial couple got married in the United mm-hmm. States. That alone is a lot of suffering. And how, I mean, so so then they lived in this intentional community, though. Right. I mean, and my dad's I mean, family, that meanwhile. That was a little bit easier. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. it was probably. Would it have been easier? It probably was a, a good place for them, given that that community was already countercultural. And so, I mean, but even then, even then it was mostly white and, um, Mm -hmm. and their union was discouraged. It was supported when they were insisted on getting married, but you know, there were some elders in the community that were like, are you sure you're going to do this? (laughs) Um, Because it was interracial. Yeah. And, you know, my dad had been disowned by his family for marrying my mom. Um, Wow. So we didn't meet them until my parents divorced. So, so his whole family was out of the picture. And, uh, but, but in terms of the larger society, it was, you know, there were other black, you know, people in this community, there were other interracial families. So my mom had, you know, some friends that, that could relate to her experience. And, uh, and there were just people there, I think that she really admired and that, looked out for her of, of many different backgrounds. So, um, but, um, but there were also, I'm sure like tons of microaggressions that in those days they didn't even have the words for it was just what, what happened. Um, so, um, so, and maybe some not so micro even, (laughs) but, um, (laughs) I mean, it was very courageous of her to, to be in that community um, so, so it really was this, I think, a very noble effort to um, go into communities all over the world. At one point, there were human development projects in every time zone of the planet, and thousands of people had joined this community. Um, mm-hmm. And it was going into communities to hold town halls to ask, what do you think needs to happen and how can we support that? So get, getting those in the community to get together and what, whether it was building a school, starting a women's cooperative, digging wells, building a bridge, you know, they would bring in dentists from, you know, developed countries into you know, underdeveloped countries, but they're all across the U.S. and um, in reservations, you know, in inner city neighborhoods, in rural areas all over, you know, South America, Africa, Asia. Um, So, so I grew up in this context of really knowing I was not here to be a consumer. I really didn't get early on this inculcation that I was going to be happy through material consumption because we lived very simply, like we didn't have money. Everyone got a stipend. We had cars in common. If we really needed it, we would sign up for it. And, you know, you could take it. But, like, you know, we've got new clothes maybe once a year. Mostly they were, you know, hand-me-downs from other kids. Um, Mm -hmm. And we went out to eat very rarely. And um, but, But I really felt a lot of, 
you know, um, a lot of spiritual nourishment. I didn't get a lot of material <laughs> yeah. uh, nourishment, but I, I felt, you know, there was like a, a lot of the decor was from all over the world. And we named our meeting rooms after, like we had the Patrice Lumumba meeting room. So I knew about Patrice Lumumba growing up as, as a six-year-old in Chicago. You know, so wow. that kind of thing was like, I had the, and I had friends from Uganda living with me and from South America and a good friend was from India and, you know, and we were buddies. And so, um, and I, I would just spend a lot of time with groups of children being guided by adults who wanted us to be conscious of what was going on. So before we even mm. got to public kindergarten, we were going through infant school when we were born then mini school as toddlers and then preschool. And I have a story someone told me because she looked after me with a group of kids when I was in preschool. She said, you know, when it was one boy's birthday, you turned to him, you all, he was turning three and you were three. And you said, Peter, tell me what's the most important thing that happened to you in the last year? And what are you most looking forward to in the year to come? Because... <laughs> Those are the two questions everyone got asked on their birthday. I had them down. So that was my, that was me at three. I was like, let's get to the that meaningful That was you stuff. at three. You know? Oh my God. Oh my so, gosh. Um, so, you know, the teachers would tell people in the order, oh, I know an order kid in my classroom because they, they know what's going on with the whole group and will tell, <laughs> will help the teacher figure out, okay, this is what's, this is the deal, you know? Because <laughs> we could read, we could read the whole classroom because we were always with other kids and we were used to being corporate, you know, like communally conscious. Right, right. But we woke up mm. at five in the morning with a bell. We'd go down for daily office in our little chapel. We were in an eight-story old insurance building that got repurposed for the offices became tiny little bedrooms for you know wow. us and then meeting rooms and so we go down for daily office every morning in the dark you know incense singing prayers and before each meal we'd have a little ceremony of like some reading or something we'd have to talk about or we'd sing songs together um yeah. so it was very you know there was a kind of rhythm of the day and yeah. a way mm -hmm. that you did things that wasn't just any old way Mm -hmm. And and you were really aware of what was happening around you because you were always around a lot of people. And so wow. it was a kind of natural thing to be mm -hmm. drawn. I mean, every I, we left that community when I was 14. And meanwhile, I spent four years in Kenya. My parents divorced. Um, we moved to Kenya for four years um, on the other side of that. Um, so I... I lived in a slum on the outskirts of Nairobi, went to school um, and came back and did junior high in Chicago. And then we left the community. The community was sort of disintegrating, actually. So we left. And I remember being 14 when I left the community and feeling so lost spiritually because here mm. we were in Atlanta. Yeah. I remember walking home from school thinking, what is this all for? Here we are, this mm. little three people in a house. You know, I lived in a black neighborhood, went to a mostly white private school. And both mm. my parents. In Atlanta. In Atlanta. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and my dad, white, was now engaged to a, a wonderful woman who was also white. So I was like this biracial girl going to a white school in a black neighborhood with two white parents. And, <laughs> but, wow, but also really... <laughs> You know, but finding myself really bereft of this sense of what's mm -hmm. the point? Why are we doing this? Point? You know, this nuclear family thing wasn't making sense to me when I had been Isn't so used to, you know, yeah, how we made meaning. Yeah, how you made meaning as a group. And so I, oh, I, I just found myself, there was this inner compass that kept leading me to community. So in college, I chose the most communal living situations each year mm -hmm. it was like this co-op and then that co-op I went to Howard my junior year okay really appreciated the black experience there I was nice. like thirsty and hungry for that and then as soon as I graduated I was like I need to find a spiritual teacher in a community it was mm -hmm. just like this 
you know, right. so I, had, I had gotten, you know, so much from my education. It was a wonderful education, but I was like, I didn't get what I needed spiritually. I didn't learn how to be happy. I didn't learn how to make meaning from that education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I went to India. I stayed at ashrams and, um, you know, and went to Africa, visited my sister-in-law's family in Addis Ababa. My, my brother married a wonderful woman from Ethiopia. Went then I went to 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 France for the summer retreat at Plum Village um, for a month long retreat. I'd never done anything really in Buddhism, but as soon as I saw Thai, I was like, "Oh, that's my teacher." You know, that was it. How that old was were it. you at that point? How I was twenty three. Twenty three when you got to Plum Village. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and so two years wow. later, I, I came back to the U.S. But basically, I lived in Plum Village for a year, and then I ordained as a nun and so much of how I was raised um, Mm -hmm. made me um, made it easy to adapt to and now another Mm -hmm. very communal where you got you got up with everybody (laughs) you brushed your teeth with everybody you went to meditation (laughs) all with everybody you you were on this this rhythm and and there was just this feeling of um, of uh, you know you could really rest back in the arms wow. of the community. And mm. yes, you know, there was conflict, there were struggles, there were times I didn't feel understood, you know, times I didn't understand where other people were coming from, but the larger mm-hmm. body of the community for me was deeply trustworthy. And, wow. Um, That's amazing. Were there many mm-hmm. other um, Black folks there, whether they were from any part of the diaspora? So I was the first one to ordain from who had any from, from of African descent. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of um, a little lonely in that respect. Um, yeah. And then later other monks and nuns ordained who were of African heritage right. from the diaspora or, or uh, mixed. Um, and you were there for 15 years? Sorry. Yeah, I was in robes for 15 years. Robes for 15 years. Yeah. Wow. And your book is points to so many beautiful lessons mm. that um, that you got from from that period of time and from your mm-hmm. teacher who is yeah. just just so rich, so mm. rich with such simple, yeah. beautiful lessons. And mm. it's now I get I get I'm so happy that we talked about this. Um and also, and, and, to, and to hear your your, your story, hmm. and and I'm I'm also you know the choices that you have made that have informed your your life choices even and coming from a you know racially mixed parentage and how that has impacted you and where you are right yeah. now. Yeah. It's just uh, an incredible story, Kara Jewel. Thank you, thank you, Kanda. Yeah, I yeah. I feel really lucky you know I, I and you know I was just on a on a call well you were maybe were there too with Resma yesterday were you there um anyway Resma, Resma yeah. missed it yesterday <laughs> oh okay well we had a visitor wonderful visitor Alixa Garcia and she she had us do I'm sorry our, who was the visitor again okay Alixa Garcia Alexa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so um so she had us do a, a meditation and um the 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 beginning reflection was feel how your the hardships in your life were given to you by your ancestors. And, Mm. and that was just such a, that resonated with me so much, like, okay, like, you know, like, anyway, I was just thinking, I'm really grateful for my life. And I'm grateful for my hardships, because they've also really made, made me into who I am. I'm still healing. And and, (laughs) you you know, know, yeah, well, this is, it, now that I know more about your life, it all makes sense of how, um, where your pa- where your passions are, um, and 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 the you know the book 
you talk about um, how to move through times of transition and challenges with, with clarity and with compassion. Um, and you have definitely seen some of those challenging times, you know, and then um, so and how to accept what is, you know, I love the part where you talk about how to accept what is, even though, you know, it's definitely not what you want, but accepting what is and how to find freedom in the midst of all of this, these challenging times. I, I think, I really think, Kairaju, that this is the core question that people are sitting with, particularly right now, you know, um, with all the worldly winds of change and all the dissension and division, uh, we're tied up in knots. Um, I'd love for you to highlight, if you will, some of the lessons in the book that you that lead us to this personal and collective freedom. And you always point to the collective freedom. And it's not just about this my personal liberation, but the collective it as well. And and how to navigate these waters right now. You bring such light to it. And I'd love if you could talk a little bit about that and some of the lessons that you are showing us in in this beautiful book that you put out. Mm. Sure. Um, so, you know, I was just talking to my partner today about the word apocalypse, because mm. you could say we're in a time of apocalypse, right? Right, right. And that, that the Greek word where this word comes from, apocalypsia, it doesn't mean the destruction of everything. It means the lifting of the veils, right. when the veils get lifted. And, um, and so I think, you know, what's so powerful about mindfulness is, um, and, you know, all of these very deep wisdom teachings about paying attention to what's happening mm -hmm. is if we, if our mind settles to where we can see what's really going on, there is a lifting of the veils of some sort, like whatever we see on the surface, we go beneath that to see something deeper, mm -hmm. right? And so um, one of the things I talk about in the book is, um, you know, practice of equanimity yeah. of, you know, when, when we're faced with, conflict or, or um, disruption or violence or upheaval, how do we come back to our center and also see the bigger picture? Because our, what our reptilian brain takes us to is um, to seeing what will protect us mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we need to protect us right for sure but we can't protect us if we don't protect the whole because what's what will be there if everything else goes and we're protecting us right. we have nothing to to live yeah. you know with and so so the that equanimity practice is looking Yes, I, I need to keep myself protected. And how do I see that I'm part of all of this? And what can I do? How can I live in a way that cares for, that is on the side of all of life? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think um, in a time where, you know, there's so much division being sown um, intentionally, yeah. to divide people um, and, and to divide species, you know, for humans yeah. to see ourselves as separated from other species, really um, coming into this place of, I, I'm here only because you're here. Mm -hmm. And so what I do completely impacts you, all other beings, all other species, what one other being does impacts me. And, um, and so um, taking sides, you know, um, working to, to protect one group against another group. Yes, we need to protect groups that are vulnerable. Yes, we need to raise our voices and put boundaries and put people in some kind of 
um, you know, situation where they can't cause harm, you know, but, um, but not in a way that disconnects us from their humanity, Mm -hmm. from our humanity. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, everyone has the capacity for, for transformation. Um, But it's not even just personal at this point, you know, because this is so structural, it's so systemic. Mm-hmm. Um, some some structures, you know, really do need to fall away and die yeah. for for what is truly life giving mm-hmm. to 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 be to have space to be able to exist. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but but the people are not, um, you know, the people who represent or who enact or who enforce these systems that are life denying. Um, we need to see them as part of this. They are part of the human family and, and, you know, yeah, yeah, everyone, everyone can shift. You know, I, this reminds me of the piece in the book when you talk about, um, uh, Derek Chauvin Mm -hmm. and the case with, um, the, the police officer in Minneapolis who murdered, um, Mr. George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And I love the way you, um, you take that instance and you call it what it is and how you metabolize the whole horror of that. Um, And from a Dharmic lens, how you, um, you want to, I would love for you to just kind of speak Mm -hmm. a little bit about that because it's such a good lesson for us to, to, I guess here's the other thing I want you to say in this is that so often people think that Buddhism means laying down everything, having no opinion, non-political, um, that where you're just holding equanimity with no opinion at all and getting involved in, in the politics of the day is not a part of what we, what Buddhism is. And it's just say so apolitical and you are, masterful at holding the lens of what you just spoke about, you know, holding people still as, as being a part of the human family and, and calling what is that's harmful and calling it harmful and saying it has to go. So I would just love for you to kind of dig a little bit deeper in that. And like, how did you metabolize the situation mm-hmm. with um, George Floyd and, and Derek Chauvin and, the, and that, yeah. that whole situation. It's a, an yeah. example of yeah. how you move through these kind of difficult issues. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, really the, the practice and the teaching uh, at Plum Village and in Thai's life, you know, was non-discrimination. So that means we see ourselves in the victim when we see mm-hmm. ourselves in the perpetrator because we know mm-hmm. that perpetrator didn't just get created out of nowhere. Right? Right. Derek Chauvin didn't get conditioned by white supremacy by himself. Right. Just like George Floyd didn't, you know, um, come into the situation he was in by himself. There were whole structures behind both of them manifesting as they did, as they do. And, um, you know, um, if we meditate and really look deeply, I, I really feel that if if any of us were born and had all the conditions that George Floyd had, we would be like him. If any of us were born into the world Derek Chauvin were born into and had all the conditions raising us like he was raised, we would be like Derek Chauvin. Right. And so, um, so I remember when I heard that they were close in age I couldn't help but visualize what would it be like if they were boys 
playing together, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, I mean, it, it kind of makes me want to cry because, like, you could really see how at that age they would be friends, you know, easily. Uh, and And life, you know, and our country and the reality of systemic racism um, led one to murder the other in a really brutal and, and horrific way. Um, and, and this is commonplace. That's the other part of the tragedy. I mean, it's only because this tender, courageous 17-year-old caught it on camera that it could be prosecuted the way it was. Probably it, he wouldn't be in jail if that video didn't exist, right? So, um, but, you know, the, the, uh, the eyes of interbeing are to see all of the non-Derek Chauvin elements that make up Derek Chauvin. Just mm-hmm. like can, we can are I, only, okay. Well, un- unpack that. All yeah, the all right. Derek Chauvin. Okay. Yeah, I love so, that. Was- so this is Thich Nhat Hanh's way of talking about inner being, right? Like okay. a flower is only made of non-flower elements, right? Like there is no separate self in a flower. Flower is made up of the sun, of the soil, of the farmer, of the animal, you know, insects in the soil, time, space, oxygen. You know? Each of us is made only of non-self elements. So we're made up of our parents, our those who raised us, all the food we've eaten, the sun, you know, all the elements time, space, our ancestors, our descendants, we're made up of them too, right? We contain all of that. The only thing we don't have is a separate us. Right. But we have everything else. (laughs) So so if we look at Derek Chauvin in that way, Mm -hmm. it turns him from being this um, monster. Mm -hmm to also being a victim, right? Mm-hmm. A victim mm-hmm. of, of d- ignorance, a victim of um, his own dehumanization. You can't do that to someone if you're not dehumanized in some way right. yourself, right? you know? And a victim of all the circumstances, you know, of the way police are trained in this country, the way police operate, you know, yep. so if we if we see all those elements, we know that um, it's the ignorance in Derek Chauvin that we want to eradicate, not Derek Chauvin, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and that he, I mean, just like George Floyd, he also needs our compassion. Yeah, but we are also not separate from him, That's just right. like we're not separate from George Floyd. And I don't think, and when I look at and think about the penal system, I mean, is it <clears throat> something that is, I mean, it, it, it's, it's just punishment and it, it doesn't, it's not like, it can happen. I mean, people, you know, I've worked at San Quentin with the, with certain, with the people and the men who are <clears throat> incarcerated there. And there's a lot of transformation that happens for sure. And it's not set up to for them to see themselves. It's not set up for them to to really um, be able to to see who they are as a part of the whole. And that's the kind of that's the kind of system that we don't have that would be so helpful, exactly. you know, and particularly right. And as we young people who yeah. end up incarcerated, young people who are taught that you are as the worst thing that you have done is who you are yeah. Yeah. at that age. Mm-hmm. And, and then put into an environment where there's, is, there's really no hope in that environment. And yeah. it's just, it's very sad. And, and what you're saying um, is that, and like uh, Brian Stevenson, who I love, Brian Stevenson and the work that he does with the, um, the Equal Justice uh, Initiative, EJI, and yeah. his book, Just Mercy, and all that he's doing in Montgomery, you know, he says that you are not 
the worst thing that you have ever done is not who yeah. you are. Yeah. Beautiful. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's kind of what you're pointing to with the Derek Chauvin situation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the kind mm -hmm. of compassion and understanding that you bring mm -hmm. at the same time, mm -hmm. knowing that what happened um, is not justified and it can't continue to happen and it has right. to stop and you have right. to do things to stop injustice. And we're all a part of that having happened. We're all connected to that. We're all part of, you know, yeah. wars. We don't, we don't support them. Maybe we don't believe in them, but the fact that we pay taxes, the fact that we're part of the society work, that's all we can't get out of, you know, we can't take ourselves out of that and say, no, that's you who did that. <laughs> Cause we, right. we did that. We right. were part of, you know, so, so yeah. we all, you know, need to really look at this whole situation of policing, police, yeah. uh, police brotherhoods, police unions, all the infrastructure, all, you know, the way we fund the whole way we look at policing, which is pretty yeah. bankrupt as a, as an institution in many ways. Um, but it's not about yeah. demonizing police. But it's about this whole society created this problem. And we're mm -hmm. part of this whole society. So what will bring the healing of the whole? You know, right. when, I, when I worked with some wonderful shaman and shamans and teachers, when I, I used to teach at Schumacher College, this environmental college in the UK. The, the woman shared about a situation in Finland where she was from when loggers were cutting down old growth trees. And mm -hmm. she said that the way you look at it in terms of shamanic healing is, yes, we need to protect the trees, but we want to bring healing to the whole situation, which includes the loggers. It's not that we are now against the loggers for cutting down the trees, but how do we bring healing to the whole? You know, I, I love that. And with that um, lens that um, is so beautiful and so true, with that lens, it also bridges that point of saying, basically, if we are all society, if we are all responsible for each other, we are all responsible for the causes and the conditions that have happened, then it begs us to get involved to make change. Yeah. It, 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 it's, 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 it's kind of the, it's like your passport into this is your duty because you are a part of that, which is happening, the good, the bad, the ugly. And so it is our duty as citizens of this planet that are interconnected. It is our duty to be involved yeah. in making it the best world that we can make it. Yeah. Yeah. I was really struck at reading about Bob Moses after he died, the civil rights legend. Yeah. He, his, his koan, I feel, to us, he was like, we need to decide what kind of country do we want to have? He was yeah. talking to yeah. the U.S., yeah. but it applies to our whole world, right? It's like you know, what, exactly what you're saying. This is all of us have to see this. What, what kind of country do we want to live in? What kind of country do yep. we want to leave behind? to those who come after yep. us. And every day we can do things to make that reality more possible. Every day, every day. Every day. Yep. You know, there's a lot of fear. Um, I think people are really gripped with fear. They're gripped with fear of so many things. Obviously it's always of the future of something. And, um, and even when I think about Derek Chauvin, you know, what fear was running through his body, you know, in his mind. And there's just so much fear um, that kind of paralyzes us. And you, in the book, you have that, that chapter, that, that part where you talk about the overwhelm and the fear. And like when you were, um, the retreats that the community was putting on and mm -hmm. you just were mm -hmm. clear that you couldn't do it. And you went to Thai and you were like, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And the lesson in that, I loved that piece. Mm -hmm. And I will always, I'm going to tell you right now, I will always remember that mm -hmm. when I am thinking that I want to run mm -hmm. from something. Mm -hmm. um, 
it would be interesting for you to kind of share that with people. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Conda. You read this book so deeply. I'm so touched. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that was a really, yeah, that was a really important moment for me um, where I really was like up against a wall. I just was like, I was this older sister in the community, very respected. And I always held this, role of kind of supporting these larger retreats and one among many but people were used to me being and I was there but I just inside I felt so confused and so um you know crumbling inside I was like there's no way I can stand up in front of a thousand people and you know play these roles that I had played in the past and so that's why I was like let me just get out of here because this would be much easier if I just didn't have to be here and <laughs> Like, and so, so yeah, so I, I went to Thai and asked if I could go to Plum Village during the time of these retreats. This is when I was living in our monastery in Germany. And he, you know, listened to me really deeply, which he always would. He took it all in, you know, with a lot of compassion. And then he just said, you know, I hear you and you can stay, not you have to stay or I won't let you leave. Nothing like that. It was just, you can stay, meaning I was capable of staying. Right. And I was kind of like, wait a minute, you know, it's so difficult. I don't know. How can I do this? And, and then he, again, he was just like, well, this is the moment you put the basic practices that we've been training in, right? Every day, all day long of mindful right. breathing, mindful walking. He's like, this is when you need to just do that basic practice of Wherever you move, you know your steps are moving. You're taking this step with your right foot, taking this step with your left foot. Wherever you are, you know this is my in-breath, this is my out-breath. So basically, he was like, that's how you get through, is you come back to Mm -hmm. the core of, Mm -hmm. you know, this is, we don't do these practices, you know, because they make us nice or because they make us peaceful. (laughs) These are our anchors when we're about to get thrown off the ship and drown. Like that's what keeps us. It's our life jacket. Yeah. You know? And, and, and so, and so as he said that something in me really listened. Mm -hmm. So all of that, you know, storm in my mind, it started to be like, okay, okay. There's some real wisdom that he's saying. And I could, I could settle in myself enough to take it in and realize, you know, he's right. I can say, I actually do have the tools to do this. And that's why this title, we were made for these times. Like all of us yeah. has that capacity yeah. to be with no matter what it is, Yeah, you know, like, and maybe it means we're crying in a heap in the corner, but we still have what whatever it is we need to meet that moment. And, and it turns out I really did. Like I, I didn't, he was like, you don't have to be, you know, making announcements or leading a group. You don't have to be in the front, but you can be here. Mm-hmm. And I realized the wisdom of staying there mm-hmm. because the energy of the community, a thousand people practicing mindfulness is some really potent energy. And that really began to, uplift and and take care of me and my soul it was very nourishing it was very wholesome and um and and the other gift of that experience was I realized oh I don't have to run away when it feels too much like I gained so much confidence in myself that okay like if I had run to Plum Village I wouldn't have learned that yeah that's amazing you know I have to I'm gonna tell just just a quick little story where um, that same practice really saved me. I was, um, I, I used to be a filmmaker in another life <laughs> back yeah. in, years ago. And mm-hmm. I was actually in Senegal mm-hmm. shooting a film about um, these uh, young girls, African girls, Senegalese young girls who were being educated. And I was there with my friend, Angela Seven, and we were shooting this film and it was just, I was the camera person. I was everything, you know, and Angela was my sidekick and helping with audio and what have you. And so we were way out in the furthest reaches of Senegal near Mali when we were, um, when I got struck with 
um, dysentery and, um, and uh, um, malaria. Wow. I, it just came over me like, whew. and we were in, the, in a vehicle driving way out to where there was nothing. And, and we had made a promise to these mothers of these young girls that we were going to shoot them, you know, do a video on a weekend. So they were coming from villages to this place mm-hmm. and we had to be there. Oh my gosh. And I have never been so sick in my life. Mm. I mean, everything was coming out. It was horrible. Mm. And so we're trying to figure out how we're going to do this. And so they, my, the people that I were with, I said, just get me to a place where I can, where I can lay down and have a flushing toilet. (laughs) Right. I just needed a flushing toilet Mm because it was just bad. Mm. They found this place in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And they dropped me off there in this room. It was just a single room and a toilet. Hmm. And I am i don't know where I am. And they are going to, my friend Angela is then is going to take off and be the camera person that she had never done before. But we had to go meet these women oh and, and shoot this, this and, hmm. you know, be there for them because they had walked very long distances to, hmm. to be a part of the film. Hmm. So they dropped me off and it's in the morning. They, we found this place. They dropped me off and I'm in this cot. I'm on this bed and I'm there by myself and they take off to do the shooting. Hmm. Kara Jewel, at one point my mind just went crazy and thought, okay, I could die right now. I don't know where I am. My family doesn't know where I am. Nobody knows where I am, but two people in the whole world. Hmm. And I am feverish. I am it's horrible. And my mind started to trip, right? And mm. then I thought, okay, kind of pull it together. Mm. And I got into inhale, you know, and exhale. Mm. And Ty's mm. teachings, as I inhale every single breath inward, I was at, I breathe in, my mind is calm. Mm. As I breathe out, my body is peaceful. Oh, in, calm out peaceful. Mm. And I did that for hours and hours. And it completely took this crazy moment and brought it into this place of, I can do this. And I did. And the day turned into night. Mm. And the next day, the sunset, it was late night. And finally, and I'm still in this cot by myself, (laughs) you know, going... I breathe in, I breathe out. I mm. breathe in and out and calm and peaceful. Mm. Finally, at night, it was probably about eight o'clock at night, I hear the door open and they've come to get me mm. after they had done the entire shoot and came back. Mm. And of course, and then I said, please take me to a hospital. And they yeah. took me right to a hospital. But mm. I have to say mm. that it was that practice. Mm. It was that practice that allowed me to live through one of the hardest times of my life. Mm -hmm. And it kept me in that place of present moment awareness that I am okay and that my mind is calm and my body is at peace. Mm -hmm. And it changed everything. And I don't know, had I not had Mm -hmm. that kind of practice and that teaching, I don't know what, what, what would have happened in the, in, during those many, many hours by myself, you know? So yeah. it is, this is not just sitting on your cushion and mm-hmm. taking these practices in, how they work in the real world. It's just mm-hmm. incredible. Mm-hmm. And your teacher, mm-hmm. Ty, who, by the way, I want to just let people know that Titnat Han is who we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And Ty is a name for a teacher, right? And, and so how, you have been mm-hmm. referencing this beautiful, beautiful spirit. Can you, in the book you referenced to that you've seen him since uh, this has happened to him, this stroke, can you just give us, do you have any update on how he's doing? You know, I, I actually got to see him in person in 2019. Right. Uh, I, went, I went to Hue where he was and um, through his hut window, I could, could wave and he could connect with me um you know he's there at the root temple in in the center of vietnam and he 
um, from what, what I've heard is, is maintaining, you know, he's 90, uh, he's 95. I think he just turned 95 in October and it's been some seven years since his stroke. Um, and you know, he, I felt a tremendous amount of spiritual presence and I know Mm. other people have shared that too like he's still very much with us um Mm. and and also you know in a in a different form um yeah but but uh he's he's present he knows what's going on he knows how to communicate you know uh what what he needs to communicate and yeah well he certainly tremendous love Mm. Mm. yeah he, he so communicates through you who you are in the world and what you bring and the presence that you are mm. is the sweetness of, of, of his teachings mm. and the beauty and the fierceness. Mm. It's all one beautiful, um, really collab, this, this, this combination. And I have to tell you that, um, I just recently completed, um, a, um, a, a retreat where I was teaching with um, my friend and, and teacher and guide, um, Tara Brock. And it was Tara's um, last, it was Tara's last retreat, um, multi-day retreat. She's still teaching, but she's just not doing any more multi-day retreats. And we just finished that online last week. And I did a talk on equanimity, right? That was my talk was on equanimity. And after reading your book, I added the phrase that I love um, that I will use from here on, you are partly right. <laughs> you are partly right. <laughs> it's just so mm. apropos. And mm. I, I have now incorporated that into my life, into my mm. world, and into my mm. teaching that, mm. you know, you are partly mm. right. Mm-hmm. I love that. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for everything. Mm. Thank you for the book. Thank mm. you for your teaching. I know that people will be wanting to reach out to you to find you. Um, your website is kairajewel.com and um, K-A-I-R-A, Jewel, J-E-W-E-L, kairajewel.com. Where, where is the book available? The book is available um, in um, independent bookstores, um, indie books and bookshop and Amazon and Parallax Press, the publisher, Penguin yeah. Random House, the distributor. Um, you could get it, ask your local library to get it too. There's Kindle. Nice. There's, yeah, so it's a bunch of different. And places. I don't, I have no idea how I got the book. It showed up on my doorstep. Did you send it to me? I don't think so. I have <laughs> I no so. idea. That's amazing. But I opened up the package and this was it. And I wow. hadn't bought it. Amazing. And I, I, <laughs> yeah, in Louisiana, I was like, I opened it up. I said, oh, my God, Kyra Jewel's new book. I was going to get it. Wow. You didn't do that. I didn't. I don't think so. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank it you, was universe. Meant to be. <laughs> it was the universe. It was meant to be. And I immediately emailed you and said, let's do, let's do your, <laughs> come on my podcast. Wonderful. This is well, wonderful. Thank you to whoever got it sent to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whoever did it, it was a blessing. It's a blessing. And um, I know that people can also see you on retreats at Spirit Rock and you mm-hmm. you have retreats everywhere. So maybe I guess on your website, people can yeah. find you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Kapanda. It's It is such a joy to be with you and to hear your stories of practice and transformation, how the book yeah. landed for you, how Ty's teachings have really become part of your life. And um, mm-hmm. I'm just so, so grateful for for you as my friend, as my beloved sibling yeah. on this path, yes. for all yes. of your yes. amazing work in the world. So oh, thank yeah. you. I want to I want to interview I, you next time. <laughs> okay, okay, we could do that. <laughs> That's awesome. So mm-hmm. I just appreciate you taking the time today. And um, we will um, see each other on the path, continue to see each other on the path, my sister. I love you so deeply. Oh, I love you too, Kanda. Big, big hugs. Hug, hug, hug. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Take a All care. All right, darling. Okay. <laughs> Peace and Bye. blessings to you.